Okay, let's get started. Let's uh, let's spend a little bit of time talking about the deliverables. So deliverable nine is due tonight. Everybody in good shape. Got two or three scaffolds implemented. Okay, getting there. Okay. Uh, we have reached that time in the semester, the 10th and final deliverable. So let's talk a little bit about deliverable 10. The structure of deliverable 10 is very much like the structure of deliverable 9. In deliverable 9, you are adding in three scaffolds. In deliverable 10, you're going to be adding in three real-time visualizations. So we spent a lot of time in this course talking about information design, visual display of information. Here's your chance to flex your creative muscles, so to speak. Um, the first visualization uh, I want you to build in is to show the user as they log in from one session to the next how their current performance in the current uh, session compares to their performance in past sessions. So again, no text here, visualizations, are they getting better? So at a glance, they should be able to see as they're working with your system during the current session, have they forgotten more material since the last time that they've, they've retained? Are they getting better or are they getting worse from one session to the next? You're going to shoot a short video of your first visualization in action that's going to show us that. So you have your user, which is probably you, doing something in first session, logging out, logging back into the second session, and you do a better job in the second session. And we can see that the visualization is showing that you're doing a better job the next, the, during this session than the previous one. How you do that is completely up to you. Shoot a, shoot a video of that visualization. And then the second visualization is a social visualization. So how is the current user doing compared to other users that have used the, the, the system so far? So create some virtual accounts in your system. Maybe user one is not so good at learning ASL. User two is better at using ASL. And when user two is using the system, we can see in the visualization that user two is doing better than user one. Again, you can do this in any way that you want. If you want to use a points system, you can. We're assuming that the users recognize numbers. So if you want to assign points and you have something like a high scoreboard, that's, that's also fine. That'll count as a visualization. OK. Uh, and then the third one, which you, the third, uh, yes, question. Uh, high scoreboard. Yes. Yes, I think, I think that's fine, right? I just outlawed English because I didn't want you giving instructions about what to do. So yes, names and scores is perfectly fine. That's, that's OK. Sure. Uh, third visualization, which again, you may already have in your system, is uh, a hot and cold visualization. So obviously, the user has to hold a certain gesture and give the KNN learner time to determine whether they're signing the digit correctly uh, or not. And you need to create a visualization telling the user to keep their hand there. And in addition, are they, is the KNN predicting correctly? Right? So you probably have in your system now that you need the KNN learner to predict three or 10 times in a row. I don't remember what it is. And that counts as a successful sign. Right? So during those iterations, you need to be showing the user that they're doing, they're assigning the sign correctly. The reason why is, of course, because uh, they, may not, they may not actually be signing at all. They may be confused about what they're supposed to be doing. And the system should be saying, colder, you're, you're not doing the right thing. Whatever you're doing, do something else. Number two down there, they may just be signing it incorrectly. Right? You may have removed one of your scaffolds which is showing an actual picture of the, of the sign. And the user forgets that this is 0 and is instead signing this. And your system should be showing that colder. right? The longer you hold this, the worse things are going for you. Change what you're, what you're doing. 
Third one, which of course is that the leap motion is not perfect, right? Occlusion and all the rest of it. They may actually be signing the sign correctly, but there might be some occlusion and the KNN learner is getting it wrong. So again, if the user sees the colder visualization showing up, hopefully they shake their hand or they change their orientation. So basically, colder should mean do something else, and warmer means you're on the right track, hold your sign as is. Make sense? Okay, three visualizations. You're going to shoot three short videos. They could be as long or short uh, as you want to demonstrate that the visualization is working. Stitch those three videos together in a playlist and, send, and post the URL to the playlist on Blackboard. Sound good? Okay, I think this one's pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, so back to uh, lecture. We're working our way through this second to last theme of the course called Looking Outward, um, which is we as a society are in the process of putting our interactive technologies out there uh, in the world. They're not hidden behind a pane of glass on a laptop or a desktop or a monitor or what have you. Right? Once you have a device that's out here in the world with us, it is sensing the world in re real time. And if I have the vibration mode of my phone turned on, it is pushing back against the world or against me and giving me information that way through my tactile sense, right? Tangible computing. So that's what we're looking at. We just finished uh, on Monday lecture 15, where we were thinking about broadening the ways in which uh, interactive technologies can project information back into the world. At the moment, it's usually visual through a screen or auditorily through speakers. We now have devices that are vibrating, or in the case of robots, moving or physically acting on the world. And we can sense the response of their movement. Right? Once you start to have those kinds of interactive technologies out here in the world <coughs> with us, that allows new kinds of interactions that were difficult or impossible before. Right? We ended last time with the interactive workbench, which was a series of magnets that could be differentially turned on and off. And if they do, they change the magnetic field on the surface of the workbench. And if you put a metal object on it, that metal object will start to move. So there are forces, physical forces, being applied to that metal object by the magnets but also by someone who's holding the object and actively moving it. So the interactive device, the magnets, and a human can together move an object, right? The actual motion of that object is a sum of the forces being applied by the magnets and by the human user. By doing that, again, we have new collaborative possibilities. You can have the sense of putting your hand on top of the hand of an instructor, and the instructor is sort of moving your hand through the motions of learning Japanese kanji or learning some other task that requires fine manual dexterity. As we continue on in lectures 16 through 19, we're going to continue on with that theme, which is once you start to deploy interactive technology out into the physical world, what new kinds of things can we do? Okay, so we're going to uh, start in on lecture 16 in a moment, uh, ubiquitous computing, which is today otherwise known as the Internet of Things, right? So actual physical objects that are computerized somehow or connected to the, the net, right? Physical objects that are also connected to, to the net. And those kinds of devices are becoming ubiquitous or they are everywhere. And as that ubiquitous technology or the Internet of Things starts to sink into and get stitched into the fabric of our physical world, what does, it, what does that collection of technologies allow us to do? In lectures 17, 18, and 19, we're going to look at three scientific experiments where ubiquitous technology is used to try and, per, and answer scientific hypotheses that would have been impossible, difficult or impossible to answer without that technology. In lecture 17, we're going to look at uh, a problem known as social network inference. So I see that there are about 30 people in front of me. I have no idea which of you is friends with, with which other ones of you. 
So if I had access to your cell phone data, could I infer your social network without looking at your Twitter data? So just looking at face-to-face -face communication, if, I, if I'm able to record that information somehow, can I infer who among you know each other and hangs out with each other outside of this classroom? On top of that, if we could draw a social network of this class, could we answer uh, social science questions like, how do you change your behavior when you interact with different members of this group? So we are all embedded in social networks, and as you know, you alter your behavior based on who you're talking with in a social network. We know that anecdotally. Can we actually measure that directly? Can we measure how people change their behavior when they interact with different individuals in a social network. That's what we're going to look at in 17. Uh, lecture 16 is pretty short today, so we will definitely get it, uh, start in on 17. Uh, 18 is, uh, we're going to look at activity tagging. So assuming your accelerometer is on, on your phone when you're moving, can your phone infer whether you are walking, running, standing still, running on a treadmill, riding in a, in a vehicle, can it actually infer your activity without you having to actually ask or tell the device? In 19, we're going to look at something that's become known as the Human Speech Ohm Project. In the Human Speech Ohm Project, which is a somewhat controversial experiment, the investigators recorded <coughs> most of the waking experience of a child during its first three years of life. And they wanted to try and ask the question of when a child utters a word for the first time, like mama or data or water, what caused them to say that word for the first time? What were the experiences from the point of view of the young child that led up to them uttering an English word for the first time? Again, we can't really do that very well at the moment. But if we have the home in which the infant resides instrumented with a lot of technology and we're recording a lot of the auditory and visual experiences of that child, maybe we can start to answer some of those questions. As you can probably tell from these short descriptions, there is obviously the ethical side of Internet of Things and ubiquitous computing, which is this is Big Brother made, made real, right? So there's the question about what we actually want to record from people in the real world. Assuming that they agree to it, and we do, what can we learn from those kinds of data sets? Okay. So let's uh, start in on lecture 16. Ubiquitous computing. Uh, I showed you this little cartoon at the beginning of uh, the semester, uh, way, way back in the Stone Age. Very few people had a computer. Then more people had computers. But more people had more phones, so now uh, if you look at the world as a whole, most people have more cell phones than computers. Some people only have smartphones. We're moving into a world now where there's more and more embedded devices out there. Embedded in the sense that as you move about your physical space, as you move about campus, you are moving into and out of range of various embedded devices that can either detect your cell phone or detect you directly, right? So they're embedded in the physical world and they are directly sensing the world. We're going to end this section on looking outward with robots, which are basically embedded devices. Robots have sensors, they can sense the world directly, but unlike embedded devices, robots can move themselves. So this is the future we're heading towards. This is the Internet of Things. Assuming we want to build such a world, what can we do with the data that is flowing out of this, this system? Okay, so uh, ubiquitous computing. There are two uh, sort of founding fathers of ubiquitous computing, um, Ken Sakamura and Mark uh, Weiser. We'll start with uh, Professor Sakamura uh, from the University of Tokyo. Um, he realized that even in the far future, so this is back in 1984, in the far future when everybody owns a computer, we're still going to only be able to sell as many computers as there are people on the planet, right? So maybe some people will have two computers, most people will have one computer. But even back in the 1980s, they were starting to embed chips in things other than computers like cars and factories and so on. So Ken, uh, Ken realized that the future is really 
uh, looking at ubiquitous computing, so developing hardware and software and operating systems for embedded devices. The computer market is going to be big, but not as big as what is now known as the Internet of, of Things. Uh, so he created the real-time operating system. So you've all heard of Windows, you've all heard of Linux, you've all heard of Mac operating systems. Uh, how many of you have heard of the Tron operating system? There are about 10 times more instances of Tron running on devices than there are uh, Windows and Mac and Linux operating systems combined. Right? This is an important aspect of ubiquitous computing is that it's out there in the world, but we're not really aware uh, of it. This is a, uh, the statistic is a little bit old now, but I think it still is the fact that embedded devices still outrank computers and laptops by an order of, of magnitude. Uh, four years later, Mark Weiser at the uh, Re uh, Xerox Research Park um, ca uh, came up with this term ubiquitous computing. It's still used kind of synonymously with Internet uh, of Things. Xerox Park, back in its day, in the 80s and 90s, this was sort of the Google campus of its day. There was a lot of basic research that went on at Xerox Park, in including uh, HCI research. Um, I assigned some reading for today, actually, and I forgot to put Mark's original, uh, original ubiquitous computing article up there, but if you Google Mark Weiser PDF, you'll probably find it. In that document, when he described his vision for this <coughs> field of ubiquitous computing, his vision would be that in the future, computers would be like our childhood. They would become an invisible foundation that is quickly forgotten. We're not sure that it's, we don't even know that it's there, but it's always with us and it's used throughout our lives. He uh, stole the term ubiquitous computing from one of the titles of one of Philip K. Dick's books called Ubiq. What was the other book written by Philip K. Dick that I've mentioned many times in this course already? Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Okay, more uh, fun reading for you over the winter break if you haven't already. Uh, Ubuk, great, great book. Okay, so this is sort of the idea about ubiquitous computing, right? Is there are more and more computers out there in the world, we don't want to be continuously aware of them, right? It would be exceedingly uh, distracting. There are a large number of laptops and cell phones in this, in this room at the moment, but most of them are pretty passive. They're not interrupting our educational exchange here, right? Your childhood is also somewhat invisible, but hopefully the lessons you learn during childhood are there in the back of your mind, and they're always readily accessible when you, when you need them. Why, so invisible is clear, why foundation? What does he mean by a foundation? One of the important uses of ubiquitous computing as a foundation is something we've already talked about, this idea of scaffolding, right? Your, your smartphone usually isn't interrupting you, but it's there to sort of give you a hand when you need it. And hopefully when you exhibit competence, your cell phone shuts up again, right? And lets you get on with whatever you're trying to, to do. So for those of you that go and work in industry and you're actually developing devices that are going to be deployed out in the physical world, the idea, the vision is to try and make sure that they're there and they're always ready to help, but they're always kind of in the background, right? They're not constantly interrupting and, and flashing up notifications and pulling your attention away from whatever you, you need to do, right? An obvious example of this is the GPS system in your, your car, right? If you put your phone up there, yes, there's the map, but better to just let the GPS voice tell you what to do so you can keep your eyes uh, on the road. So when you turn on real-time navigation, even if the screen is on, it shouldn't be flashing up notifications that draw your eyes to the phone without your agreement, right? We talked about visual attention. There are lots of things that will distract you and cause you to look at your phone. You surely don't want that to happen while the user is, is driving. Okay. I think we've already talked a fair bit about scaffolding, so we'll carry on. Okay. Let's try and apply some of these ideas of deploying technology out into the world. And we're going to focus in this example here on deploying technology into indoor environments first rather than outdoor environments. 
Why is it easier to think about instrumenting a classroom or a home with technology than it is outdoor environments? Technology can be more delicate than indoors. The technology can be more delicate, right? Stuff is going to break. It's going to be more easy for stuff to break out outdoors. What else? Exactly. So for deploying technology into indoor environments, there are usually power sources and Wi-Fi readily available. Not so much outdoors. Right? Remember that we're talking about embedded technology here. So these are devices which directly sense their surroundings. The moment you go outside, and it depends on what you're sensing, your, your sensory experience is much more complicated. Right? Look around you. This classroom looks more similar to other classrooms than other outdoor environments do to each other. So the moment we have machines that are sensing things outdoors, it's much more difficult on the machine to figure out what's going on. So it's easier to deploy machines indoors first and let them learn about classrooms and rooms and houses and, ho and hospitals and factories and so on before we move them outside. Okay, so we're going to tackle, again, a, a very real and very pressing issue, uh, which is aging populations. Um, I'm going through this with my father at the moment, trying to make a decision about how much longer he can live comfortably in his own home. As you can imagine, this is a very difficult uh, process to go through. Can we instrument uh, homes that help elderly people continue to live in their homes in a comfortable manner? What kind of technology would we deploy? Before we start to think about that kind of technology, um, just to sort of impress upon you the importance of this problem, here's an interesting visualization. Have you seen population pyramids before? What, does a pop what do these population pyramids tell you in particular? Absolutely, right? So populations are aging, right? And there isn't a lot, there is much less younger people replacing them. What else can you draw from this visualization? Yes, so females are increasing their longevity at a faster rate than males. Both are increasing their longevity, but there is uh, a gender difference here. What else? The percentage of elderly is increasing significantly compared uh, to the rest of the population. Absolutely, right? So let's have a look at this projection for 2050. Uh, in this particular country, it's projected that in 2050 there will be 53.6 people, 53.6% of the population that are working, so about half of the population working and half the population not working, either retired or not yet working. This is the scary point, right, that every country or most countries are approaching, which is this threshold in which there are now more, less people working than there are not working, right? Okay, last question. Anybody know what country this is in particular? This problem is worse in some countries than others. Japan. Japan is the worst one, but this is not Japan. Germany. Not Germany. There's a couple hints in here to... to, to it's got to be UK, right? Ministry of Health. Sounds like thank UK. you. The Ministry of Health and Labor is spelled properly with a U, right? Unlike the American way of spelling it. Okay. So there's a real uh, important societal issue. Um, one possible solution is to try and reduce the amount of social, uh, social security that's needed for people that have retired, and one good way to do that is to allow them to, uh, is to, allow them to remain self-sufficient for as long as possible. Okay, so I'm going to start you out with an example here, and you're going to turn to your neighbor and start to fill in some more of the details here. This particular drawing here uses a notation that you'll see sometimes in HCI called ERMIA, uh, again, a fancy acronym for uh, Entity Relationship Modeling. So entities in an ERMIA drawing uh, are shown with a rectangle, and lines are relationships between them. So in this case, we have one physical object, a carpet, 
and wo woven literally into this car uh, carpet are n computational entities, pressure sensors. Inside the home of Miss X, there are a number of these uh, carpets. So this is just a simple way to sort of show how physical and computational devices are connected together in, in this case, Miss, Miss X's home. One aspect of the problem of elderly people who are trying to remain in their home is family members trying to ascertain their current status. My father lives in Toronto. Sometimes I call and he doesn't pick up the phone. I don't know why that's the case. Right? So one possible way to do this, and again, this is a bit of a cartoon example here. Imagine we were to try and develop a, 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 a system where the caller on the phone gets one of three mes messages. Um, either the phone continues to ring because in this case, Miss X is making her way towards the phone. If she's moving slowly towards the phone, maybe a, a message is embedded in the call saying, don't worry, Miss X is, is making her way towards the phone. Or I can't detect the fact that Miss X is making her way towards the phone. Right? These are three very different situations that a caller might like to know about before having to call another family member or caregiver to go and check on Miss X at her, at her home. Okay, so we have a number of carpets. There are pressure sensors that are embedded in there. The pressure sensors through the carpets are reporting all of the data in real time into a sensor network device, which is doing some machine learning on all this pressure data to determine is Miss X up and about and is she making her way towards the phone. Okay, turn to your neighbor. Let's stick with the same problem. What are some of the issues that an elderly person might face in remaining in their home? How might you instrument the home to make things uh, easier, or more comfortable for them or their caregivers? Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to talk about that and then we'll see what you came up with. Okay, let's uh, discuss solutions. Ideas. We're talking about just having, you know, either use the floor sensors or whatever to make sure things are turned on or off with the, the how sensors your home. Um, well, things are turned on and off. So how, so let's you know, like get... If you leave the house, yep. you sometimes are forgetful as you get older. 
and you can't say, like, did I leave the oven on or did I leave the coffee pot on? This way it can sense pressure sensors in your house to see if you're still there and it can tell when you leave. So after you leave, it would turn everything off. Absolutely, right? So a combination of appliance sensing and pressure sensing and, and looking for that particular combination. Yep, definitely be an important one. Other ideas? I think for the elderly, one of the biggest problems is fall. And like if you have no idea of knowing whether or not they're on the ground. So one of the things that we were talking about was he was talking about, you know, potentially having some sort of an accelerometer in addition to having sensors around the house. So the sensors don't actually sense any movement around the house for a certain period of time. You could kind of infer that maybe they need someone to come and check on them. Absolutely, right? So there are a lot of companies that are looking at exactly that problem, right? Detecting falling because you can't assume that after a fall, the, the subject can communicate that, right? Absolutely. So again, we started this course thinking about our uh, putting people first, right? So it depends. What are the particular challenges that a particular elderly person is dealing with? If it's memory, that might be an important solution. If it's physical disability, detecting falls might be important. What are the other aspects for this particular demographic that could be ameliorated with technological solutions? Automated cars. Automated cars, yes, that, that's a good one. It's not just going to help the elderly. Right? I, I grew up in Florida. Automated cars, I can't <laughs> wait for that day. Okay, okay. It's coming. What else? Specific to this demographic. Um, we were thinking about changing like, the people with uh, language mobility. Okay. We could have some kind of system that will um, like, turn off appliances automatically. Like, Absolutely, right? So that, that's... Some... Okay. So the social dimensions of this, right? So were there other voices detected in the home on this day other than the voices that are coming out of a TV or a, a computer, right? Socialization, incredibly important. For some old people having trouble, like, feeding themselves and going to the grocery store, so you could have something that maybe detects some food they have in the house. Absolutely. Absolutely. Really important. Yep. How many hours per day are they sleeping? How much time are they spending in bed? Right? This is another important one, which also impinges now on acceptability, right? So uh, Miss X might allow sensors in her carpets or sensors on her appliances, but sensors in the mattress? I don't know. That's pretty intrusive, right? So obviously there is going to be a very sharp antagonism here between privacy and support, right? This is incredibly important. How much, Big Brother, might we be allowed to instrument in an elderly person's home, right? How much will they accept? It might work perfectly, right? Best thing is slap a GPS transponder on my father and we, I know exactly what he's doing at all times. Probably not very acceptable. I've tried. I know it's not acceptable. Okay. Again, um, a pretty important problem. Uh, in this country, you all are going to be working when the United States crosses this magic threshold. So this is something that's maybe worth thinking about. OK. So uh, again, ubiquitous computing, that was a pretty short lecture. Main message here is, again, we want to try and instrument the world as best we can. But we want to make sure at the same time that it's doing good work for us. It's providing the scaffold, and it's invisible, right? It's out there in the background, and it's acceptable. It's not recording things that we would prefer that it does not record. OK. To point up the ethics of this particular kind of technology, I wanted to start with social network inference. So this is an actual, the reading uh, for this for lecture 17, I've just assigned it as optional reading. This is the actual research paper uh, itself. OK. OK, so here's the idea. As you're going to see in a moment, we're going to instrument some graduate students with some technology because we want to try and answer so a specific hypothesis, which is, can we use ubiquitous computing to extract face-to-face -face information? So not trawling your social network feed, but extracting face-to-face -face information from social groups. So when you're actually talking amongst yourselves, can we detect it? And can we use that information to infer how or whether you change your behavior in different social groups? Something that is exceedingly difficult to do without 
technology that is being worn by the people in the study. Okay, so uh, in this particular research paper, uh, the professor managed to convince 24 of her graduate students to wear this uh, backpack, and it had uh, a sensor pack right up here uh, on the left shoulder, and in the small backpack there was some other electronic uh, equipment to record and store the sensor data. So even back in 2008, this was a little bit bulky. You could probably do this just with a smartphone as long as you're wearing it somewhere near your mouth because this study is going to rely on speech. So throughout this six-month period that these 24 graduate students were wearing this device, the device was capturing their speech. This is, again, a pretty controversial and pretty invasive uh, experiment. So a big stipulation here was that what the graduate students said was immediately thrown away. And the only thing that was kept is the volume at which they were speaking and how they were speaking. So inflection and paralinguistics. How loud, how quiet, how high-pitched, how low-pitched, how rapidly were they speaking, how slowly were they speaking, but the actual words were scrubbed and thrown away and were never recorded. Okay. Again, because from an HCI perspective, thinking about this experiment, the graduate students might have agreed to this experiment, but if there was a third person standing nearby that was just chatting with these two students, had no idea about this study, their voice might also be picked up by the device. That third party did not sign any, any agreement, right? So again, thinking about technology out in the world, we need to think carefully <coughs> about the people that are gonna be interacting with the technology. There are the subjects themselves, and then third-party stakeholders who may have no idea that they're being recorded and included in this, this study. Okay. So step one, assuming we have this speech data over this six-month period from these 24 people, can we take that speech, uh, that speech data and try and infer among them who are friends? So we could, again, ask to see their Twitter feed or get them to fill out a survey, but can we actually infer it directly from the, the data? And then finally, once we infer the structure of the social network, can we see whether your relationship or where you exist in the social network, does that influence how you behave in the group? Okay. They didn't, the subjects here didn't actually wear these devices 24 hours a day for six months. That would definitely be too invasive. They wore it uh, for working hours just for one week out of the month. The other three weeks they didn't wear it uh, for this six-month period. As I mentioned, there was this sensor board that was pretty close to their mouth. There were a lot of other sensors on that board. They were all turned off. The only thing that was turned on is the microphone that was ca ca uh, capturing this speech data. And then they had a PDA in the background that was scrubbing out the actual words and just recording uh, uh, the aspect of speech and not the content. And then those speech statistics were being stored on an SD card. So at this point in time, how fast was the person speaking? What was the pitch of their voice? What was the volume? And so on. Okay, let's start to look at some of this data. I imagine from the, I apologize from the back of the room, you probably can't read these uh, axes. So each of these five panels corresponds to Monday, Tuesday through Friday. Um, it goes from 9 a.m. on the left side of each panel to 8 p.m. on the right side of the panel. And it's a histogram reporting <coughs> the total number of person seconds speaking, or PSS, captured by one of the 24 grad students during that period. So a person second speaking is, uh, so as an example here is just the total amount. So if there was one person among the 24 people that was speaking for four seconds, that's four PSS. If among the 24 devices uh, the 24 devices re reported that two people were talking for two uh, seconds. That's also four PSS. So the total height of the bar is basically the total amount of talking going on among that group of 24 people. It does not report 
who was talking to whom, what they were saying, what the emotional content of their voice was. It's just total amount of talking time. And already, just with that raw data, you can already start to see some pattern in this data. What is it? You'll notice there are relatively tall blocks Tuesday and Thursday morning. Why? Class schedule, right? And it was probably uh, it was probably a seminar rather than a lecture. Why? I don't know, but that would be my guess. Lots of different people are talking, right? So if you were all were wearing those devices, I tend to talk at a pretty high volume. So that device might pick up the fact that someone is talking, but the device the microphones were calibrated so that if somebody spoke at a regular volume the device would know that it's not the person wearing the device that's talking, it's somebody else that's talking. And if none of the 24 devices report that the ego, meaning the person wearing one of those 24 was talking, it's not counted here. So a PSS means that it was one of the 24 grad students that was talking, right? Someone, there was a mouth that was about this close to one of the microphones. So your devices would be picking up my voice, but at a lower volume, because you're further from me. And it was calibrated to make sure that that wouldn't count as a PSS. So those bumps at Tuesday and Thursday morning means at least either one of the grad students was doing all the talking, or a bunch of the grad students were doing quite a bit of talking Tuesday and Thursday mornings. What else can you tell from this? Yeah, maybe. Kind of hard to see it in there, right? The fact that you can't see it kind of tells you something already. If you saw a spike around noon, what would that mean? They're eating lunch together, right? So there is activity. There's height. The bars have height around lunchtime, but not really much higher than anywhere else. So maybe they did have lunch together, but it wasn't a significant fraction of them compared to Tuesday and Thursday morning where there were a lot of them talking at a, in about the same time period. So you can already see from this raw data how we can start to infer something about the collective behavior of this group of 24 individuals. Okay, let's keep going. That's the raw data, right? We can't really say much about the social network except that they were in class together Tuesday and Thursday morning. So let's try and drill down into this data a little bit further and see if we can actually start to infer who was talking to whom in this. Okay, so here's a, here's a cartoon example. Let's imagine that a class has just ended and there are three grad students who stayed behind in a classroom and they were talking amongst themselves. They were close to one another, those three, in the classroom. Outside in the hall, there were two more grad students who were talking amongst themselves. Let's imagine that that's the case. Let's imagine that the conversation in the classroom starts. The classroom uh, conversation outside the classroom has not yet started. As the conversation in the classroom continues, the, the conversation outside starts. There are two different conversations, they just happen to overlap in time. So far so good? Okay. Here's my little cartoon of what that might have actually looked like from the point of view of the five microphones being worn by those five grad students. So here's the three speakers in the classroom. Speaker one says something and then stops talking. Speaker two responds to what speaker one said, and speaker three then says something as well. During the, this period here, outside in the hall, speaker four said something to speaker five, and speaker five said something to speaker four in response. The vertical axis here is volume, so obviously when speaker one is speaking, Microphone one is recording high volume because the mouth that is speaking is close to the microphone. Why does volume drop to a medium level but not zero immediately after speaker one stops talking? 
Because it's picking up speaker two and then three. Absolutely. So in this little cartoon here, when speaker one stops talking, microphone one is picking up the speech, first of all, from speaker two, and then from speaker three. I'm assuming in this cartoon example that speaker two and three are about equidistant from speaker one, right? When speaker five is speaking here, it doesn't register at all at this point in time on microphone one. Why? So right here, when speaker five is just finishing what speaker five had to say, speaker, microphone one is reporting no volume. Why? It's below the volume threshold. Four and five are out in the hall. Maybe the doors are closed, right? They're, they're separate conversations that are happening. Okay, so that's the conversations. That's the physical context about what's going on. Here's the raw data that we have. How do we actually go from this data to inferring this picture? That at this point in time, or during this short time sequence here, these three people were talking and these two people were talking amongst themselves. Tricky. Right? In order to do so, the uh, investigators used a measure called mutual information. Is any, any mathematicians here? Anyone taken any information theory yet? Mutual information, you can think of this as a fancy form of correlation. So mutual information means that if I measure one phenomenon, that gives me information about what's happening somewhere else. When mutual information between two phenomena is high, that means I can just me measure this phenomenon and I can predict perf per perfectly what's going on with phenomenon two. If mutual information between those two phenomena is low, that means when I measure this phenomenon, I cannot tell you what's going on with the other phenomenon. And I'll show you an example of mutual information applied to this problem. Let's imagine at this particular point in time, I'm looking at the data coming from microphone two, and I see that volume is high throughout this period here. So I'm measuring phenomenon one, which is the volume coming from microphone two. And I see that whenever, again, only during this time period, during this time period, whenever volume uh, is high for microphone two, it is always medium for microphones one and three. That means mutual information is high in this case. During this period, whenever I see that volume, uh, microphone two's volume is high, I know, I can predict, that the volume for microphones one and three is medium. They're sort of correlated, right? Whenever two is high, one and three is always medium. Why, why is that important? Why did I pick that particular point in time? During that period, there's high mutual information, which means what? Let me give you a counterexample. Let's say, I, let's say I'm moving along this time window and I'm looking at the different microphones. I'm moving along this time window and now I'm looking at microphone four and I say, aha, during this period, microphone four was always high. But whenever my microphone four was high, sometimes microphone three was low, sometimes microphone three was medium, and sometimes microphone three is high. That means the mutual information between microphone four and three is low. If I detect that microphone four is high, I cannot predict what the volume of microphone three is going to be. They're uncorrelated, or the mutual information is low. Why does that matter? You can tell who's actually interacting with each other as opposed to just I can, I can see who's interacting with whom, right? So if you and I are standing close to one another, I talk, and whenever I'm talking, my volume is high, and because you're close to me, your volume is always medium, and then when you talk, your microphone is always high, and mine is always medium, during that time period that we're talking to one another in close physical proximity, there is high mutual information between our two microphones. 
someone else in the class is out walking around campus and their volumes are going up and down on their microphone and it's completely uncorrelated with what I'm saying here in the classroom to you. So at that point in time, our two microphones have low mutual information and I can infer from that that we are not engaged in a face-to-face -face conversation during that time period. Okay, so we've got part of the way from raw volume to starting to infer social networks. We'll continue with that on Friday. You have deliverable 9 due tonight. Deliverable 10 is now online if you want to get started on that. And you also have a quiz due tonight. Thanks very much.